Thank you, Neil. After that joke, I don't know if I can uh, measure up to that, uh, but we will certainly try. Um, it's uh, great to be here. I very much appreciate the invitation to come here to Minnesota and speak. It's my second time to be in the state. The first time I was here, the state bird, the mosquito, took me out of state. So I hadn't been back for some 33 or 30, yeah, 33 years, I think. Um, so I, I try and avoid those big birds. Um, are we just about there? It's a great time to be a Bible-believing Christian. You know, science is on our side. It always has been, because the author of the Word is the author of the world. He's one and the same. He does not contradict himself. And so it's great, so that when science is properly interpreted, it always confirms Scripture. So, you've come a long way, baby. It's a transition in the circulatory system at birth, comparing what happens from the conditions before birth into those after birth. So fuel, check. Lights, check. Oil pressure, check. We've got clearance. Okay, Jack, let's get this baby off the ground. <laughs> All right, let's start with some scripture. Romans chapter 12, 2a. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God gave us a mind. We are made in his image. He is the utmost intelligence. He gave us intelligence. And so, unfortunately, too many times we don't show evidence of that intelligence. Uh, but, uh, sad but true, but um, we need to exercise that intelligence. And so that's what we're gonna do today. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. See, there's no way that uh, someone who wants to say that God used evolution can happen because right here, it's very direct that at the beginning, not after millions and billions of years, that man was brought into existence by God creating him directly. Man directly from the soil, that's why us guys are dirty and the wives are always telling us, go take a shower. <laughs> but the ladies, you know, you're clean because Eve came from the side of Adam. And this is a very familiar verse, uh, Psalm 139, for you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. It's very true. Unfortunately, many people stop there, but they need to continue. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. So deep down inside, all of us know we were created, but some of us are very good at trying to suppress that, ignore it, and argue against it. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, meaning the womb, being down in the pelvis, the lowest part of the torso. So let's go over some things uh, that people can relate to during the development of the uh, baby in the uterus, in the womb. At six weeks, is the first thing that most folks can relate to, and that's when the earliest time at which the, the fetal heartbeat can be picked up on ultrasound. And then after that, at 10 weeks, is when organ formation is complete. For the most part, for most of the organs, the um, structures around the neck are not yet totally complete, nor the <coughs> organs of reproduction, but they will be by the time of birth. Um, the brain does not finish growing physically in size until age eight. But I say physically because the inner connections, the synapses in the brain really aren't finished uh, forming until around 23 or 24 years of age. That's why we can truthfully say we have brainless teenagers. <laughs> All right. The first fetal movement is felt uh, around 18 weeks of uh, development. Uh, mother feels uh, kicking or punching. Uh, the old-fashioned term for that is quickening. I remember I had one 16-year-old uh, patient in the emergency department who came in with a complaint of uh, abdominal pain. And I said, well, please describe your pain. She says, it feels like I'm being punched. So I examined her, got a urine pregnancy test, indeed she was pregnant, I said, yes, indeed, you are being punched from the inside. <laughs> so, so, and her mother, who was 32, said, doggone it, you did the very same thing I did. So this mother's gonna be a grandmother at 32. You know, some folks are really fertile. 
So then the green bar here shows uh, the uh, normal expectancy for the amount of time that is needed for the pregnancy to fully develop for the baby to come out at term. And notice it says 38 weeks there rather than 40 weeks. Well, that's because it's actual 38 weeks of development, but everybody, it's easier for them to relate to the last menstrual period, and that's two weeks prior to the time of conception. So that's why the, in the common uh, reference, it's 40 weeks rather than 38 weeks, count, adding the two weeks from the last menstrual period. Then at uh, the 10 to 12 week period, there's the onset of the placenta beginning to do its work of taking care of the developing baby. Prior to that time, the placenta itself is busy developing and, and maturing and getting ready to do its work. So in those first 10 weeks, the nutrients are simply uh, getting to the developing baby uh, through simple diffusion. Then after that uh, change takes place, uh, because the, the baby is becoming of a significant size now, uh, diffusion is not adequate, and so the placenta kicks in and starts doing its job of acting as lungs, kidneys, livers, just, just about every organ in the body uh, to do the job for the developing baby. And then by 32 weeks on average, there's enough of a molecule, a set of molecules called surfactant uh, developed in cells inside the lung uh, so that the baby would be able to survive and breathe on the outside uh, and be able to oxygenate adequately once outside of the womb. So babies born before 32 weeks most often uh, need a ventilatory support, sometimes be put on a mechanical respirator uh, depending upon how early they are. And then after 32 weeks, 34 weeks, most of the children are well enough uh, along with the amount of surfactant uh, that keeps the lungs open so that those air chambers don't collapse uh, each time the baby breathes out. Then here at 28 weeks is the uh, uh, amount of weeks of development of a particular case I'm going to tell you about here, a 22-year-old uh, white uh, pregnant female for the first time pregnant was a nurse and she developed uh, regular strong contractions and being a nurse she knew that these were the true contractions of labor not the false Braxton Hicks contractions that many women uh, can experience but th they're not the real deal and so because of that uh, she knew that she needed to head into the hospital so she called her obstetrician let him know to come in uh, she also called a cab to take her to the hospital because her husband was working uh, out in the field where there was no uh, phone service and so as she's on the way into the hospital, uh, she noted that the umbilical cord exited, was now on the outside, and this was a cause for concern because it could get trapped between the baby's body and the wall of the uterus and be compressed and compromise oxygen supply to the uh, baby, and especially you worry about the brain. So then uh, when the uh, obstetrician got there, he completed the delivery of the baby and I will complete the account of this patient situation later on in the course here. So let's now turn to the adult circulation and I'm going to give you a whole bunch of arrows to follow here, uh, kind of like driving here in the, in the metropolitan freeway system which we experienced these past few days with all the detours and construction, it's been real fun. Uh, I thank the Lord for GPS. Uh, so in the adult here, I'm going to show you that blood returning from the head and the arms, you know, is coming down from the upper body into a large vein that's big enough that you can actually look at a, through a cross section of it and you can see that it's hollow structure and it's named the vena cava, that's what it means, hollow vein, because it's large enough to see through the opening. And then from the lower part of the body is the same thing, it's called the inferior vena cava as opposed to the superior vena cava from the top one returning uh, blood from the lower part of the body and the lower extremities. So then these empty into the right atrium and the word atrium comes from Roman architecture where the building would be square or rectangular with an open area inside the courtyard where rain could fall directly into the ground and there's no roof to control the rainfall. Well this is the, why the term is used here because there are no valves to control the flow of the blood into the atrium so therefore it's named the atrium and it's on the right side of the heart. So it receives the blood from the body. 
Then the blood flows through a valve into the right ventricle, and the term ventricle is used because it means belly. So the lower two chambers are the belly of the heart, the lower part of the heart. And so then it goes there, then flows out, goes through pulmonary artery uh, to the lungs. It splits to both sides to go to the lungs where the blood can be oxygenated. And then you notice that the color of the blood vessel is changed from blue to red to represent the oxygenated blood. So in the adult, the only artery that has deoxygenated blood is the one going to the lungs, the pulmonary artery, and the only vein that has oxygenated blood is the one going from the lungs to the heart, taking the newly reoxygenated blood to the left atrium, the top half, down through a valve, into the bottom, the belly, the left ventricle, and then it's pumped out through the aortic valve, through the aorta, the very large blood vessel, which kicks the blood to the entire body. First branch off the aorta is that which serves the heart muscle itself. You all probably familiar with the term, the coronary arteries. And so that's where the coronary arteries come from, the very early part of the aorta. And then uh, that serves the heart muscle itself. And then the further branches then go to the head and neck serving the brain and the uh, arms as well. And then it courses down through the aorta as it goes down into the abdominal region serving the rest of the body. And then returns back and that cycle goes again and again. The simple way of looking at this is that blood goes from the left side to the body, back to the heart, through the right side, to the lungs. Okay, that's the Reader's Digest version of all those arrows. And then back to the heart, back to the left side, back to the body, and so on. So that's the adult circulation. And we use the term adult circulation and apply that to anybody after they have been born, because they have that configuration, that flow uh, system. So now let's take a look at what happens before birth. So we call this the prenatal c circulation. And so I'm going to show you these arrows here with the aorta coming down from the chest uh, after the blood has exited the heart. And so I'm showing here that there are branches to the gut, not too much blood flow to the gut because it's not doing the work of digesting. It's simply growing and developing. Branches to the Kidneys, again, they're not doing a whole lot of work. They're mostly growing and developing. And then, then the aorta splits into two so that a, an artery can go to each leg. And then off of each of those arteries, they each have a branch, branch that go off to go through the umbilical cord to go to the placenta so that that blood can then, in the placenta, be reoxygenated receiving oxygen from the mother, from her lungs to her blood to be transferred to the baby's blood. The mother's blood and the baby's blood are not supposed to mix and normally do not. So here is now uh, an expansion of that to give you a little better idea of what happens with the placenta. So here is showing the umbilical arteries and I put that in blue to remind you that that's the deoxygenated blood from the baby going the placenta so that it can be reloaded with oxygen. And so you see here with that very pale blue color there, the uh, placenta itself, and then the tan color shows the uterine muscle that makes up the wall of the uterus, of the womb, uh, which is later on going to be the muscle that pushes that baby out, you know, like punting out a football, all right? And then you see here the lining of the uterus uh, with that reddish-orange color, and that lining is then what has the uh, blood supply from the mother that comes into extremely close contact with the baby's blood, but not mixing. So now here is a magnification of that, showing this extensive branching of the capillaries from the baby in the placenta. All the placental tissue comes from the same source as the developing baby, from that first cell when the egg and sperm unite. The placenta itself is fetal tissue. It is not maternal tissue. And so what happens there is the baby's blood is, I'm showing you there with those capillaries, and villi 
a plural, villus singular, is the term used for this tuft of hair, and that's what villus means, tuft of hair, this bundle of very, very small capillaries. So here now is a magnification of that to let you appreciate that the mother's blood and the baby's blood are only separated by two or three layer thick, cell layer thick. Two or three cells is all that's in between the mother's blood and the baby's blood. So between, through the membranes of those cells, everything diffuses um, the nutrients and the oxygen to the baby, the carbon dioxide and the waste to the mother from the, from the baby through these membranes in these very small capillaries in the placenta. So here I'm showing you mother's blood bathing these collections of capillaries of the baby, but they are not supposed to mix. So we're showing here the carbon dioxide going out, the oxygen coming in, and now the umbilical vein indicated with the red color is in the baby, the second vein that has the oxygenated blood. All right. So now the oxygenated blood comes back from the placenta through the umbilical cord to the baby, and there's a branch that goes off to supply the liver, and then there's a big bypass there so that the great majority of the blood coming back from the placenta bypasses the liver, and then goes into that large vein coming from the lower body, returning blood to the heart. Okay, so the hepatic vein, hepatic means liver, so it takes blood into the liver itself so it can grow in development. The ductus venosus is that bypass around the liver, taking the most highly oxygenated blood to the heart by the most directive route possible. So that blood then from the placenta that's most highly oxygenated is now put into the inferior vena cava, which also is carrying all of that blood from the lower part of the body. So now you have these two separate streams of blood that minimally mix, flowing side by side with each other, going back to the heart. And you say, well, how can this be? Well, here's a, uh, an example here from a different context, but it makes the point beautifully. This is the Amazon River where the Rio Negro joins it and dumps its water into it. The Amazon starts high up in the Andes at high speed and carries a high level of silt uh, as it drops from high altitude down to the lower altitudes. So that's that darker color, or I shouldn't say darker, but that creamier tan colored water carrying that silt load. On the uh, left hand side is the water from the Rio Negro. In Spanish, Rio Negro means black river. And this river starts at low altitude, uh, coming from the north, from Venezuela into Brazil, and is at low altitude, slow speed, no silt load, and it comes from the hot jungle, and so leaves that fall into the river from the jungle uh, make it basically a giant teapot. You know, it's got warm temperatures there in the jungle. So that's why it's this clear, dark water with organic material dissolved into it. And so these two separate streams in the same channel go for many, many, many miles before they start mixing. And, and so uh, that's what's represented here. And then in a more personal way, m uh, most of us probably experience this when you walk into a store that uses an air curtain with high velocity to keep the, use that cold air to keep the hot air from outside. Uh, from getting into the store. So it's that kind of same thing. We call it laminar flow, layered flow. So this layered flow is what is happening here in the inferior vena cava so that the oxygenated blood returning from the placenta flows alongside but hardly mixes with the deoxygenated blood coming back from the lower body. And this is again in that inferior vena cava. So now the return from the upper body, the deoxygenated blood there, also enters the right atrium as does this blood from the inferior vena cava. And then you see the red arrows showing the oxygen going across 
through this opening connecting the top half of the heart so, the blow, so it goes directly from the right top half to the left top half through what's called the round window and the technical term in Latin is foramen ovale. And so it flows through there so that the most highly oxygenated blood has the shortest, most direct route to serve the heart and lung, uh, the heart and brain. And then courses on down. And the deoxygenated blood then goes on down into the uh, right ventricle. So here I'm showing this again. So there are those that laminar flow coming into the right atrium and with the oxygenated blood going to the uh, left side of the heart through the foramen ovale and then the deoxygenated blood coming down and going down into the right ventricle, the lower part of the heart. And there are two special structures here, uh, the eustachian valve and the Thebesian valve, which are highly engineered designed structures which guide the flow of these streams so that they remain as separate as possible. Very highly engineered. These are not things that just arose by random chance events. All right. So showing this again, there you see that the most highly oxygenated blood then goes down from the left atrium into the left ventricle and then goes to the aorta so it can go by the shortest route to the coronary arteries to serve the heart and the vessels going up to serve the brain especially. And then coursing on down. Then showing here then the deoxygenated blood going directly through to the right ventricle then to uh, avoid mixing with the oxygenated blood and then going to the body. So you see, I'm sorry, to the lungs and then um, back from the lungs and then to the left side of the heart again. Now in this turquoise oval is another bypass. We already spoke of the bypass going around the liver. Now here is a bypass that goes around the lungs. Why is that? Well, the lungs are not doing any work of oxygenation. The baby is still inside the womb. So they only need a smaller amount of blood flow to get the nourishment and oxygen they need to grow and develop. So the amount of blood going through the lungs is only 10% of what comes out of the heart. The other 90% of the blood flow coming out of the heart bypasses the lungs, goes through that bypass surrounded by that turquoise oval, and then mixes with that oxygen blood after the heart and brain have been served, and then goes down the aorta to the rest of the body. And so that's why I colored those arrows purple to indicate the mixing of the oxygenated and lesser oxygenated blood. And then down to the placenta, reoxygenating and back up again. All right, let's make this simple. What you have here is this loop surrounding, uh, going through the baby's body, okay, going through the heart, all right, serving the body, all right, of the developing baby. You have a side loop that goes to the placenta, picking up oxygen and nutrients, getting rid of CO2 and waste products then another side loop going to the lungs so that they can grow. So I, you can see I made the size of the loop going to the lungs, it's supposed to represent 10% of the amount coming out of the heart. So that's the simple version of what I just gave you in the more complete form. All right, so the postnatal circulation, the adult cir circulation, all this stuff we talked about that looks like this, Okay, so the newborn, same as the adult, okay, from the right side of the heart to the lungs, through the left side of the heart to the body, and back. Okay? Then the changes must occur. What must happen to make all this stuff work, to make it happen? So remember, here's the prenatal with its three separate loops. Here's the newborn with the one loop that just goes figure eight, back and forth, back and forth, body, lungs, body, lungs. 
So that connection, that the shortcut through the top half of the heart, through the foramen ovale, has to close. That ductus arteriosus, the bypass around the lungs, has to close. The ductus venosus, the bypass around the liver, has to close. The umbilical vein closes and the umbilical arteries close. So those five things have to happen, and they all have to happen right away, so that everything can be the way it's supposed to be once the baby exits the mother. So, here's how these things happen. First of all, when the baby leaves, there has to be initiation of breathing. There has to be stimulating the brain, saying, tell the muscles of breathing to breathe. And so when the baby exits, there, there are these sensors that pick up changes in temperature, all right, change in pressure, stimulation, touch. And these send messages to respiratory centers at the base of the brain saying, breathe, take that first breath. So then signals are sent back from that part of the brain to the muscles that we used to breathe, the muscles between the ribs and the, and the diaphragm, that muscular sheet separating the chest from the abdomen, saying, breathe. All right? So that's why it's all important, that first breath that gets things going. All right, so that's what we talked about there. And so this is the result. All right? And so, and just to make sure, that's why the, the doctor delivering the baby gives that extra slap on the rear end to make sure that baby takes that first all-important breath. And I've got to tell you, I've had the joy of delivering some 200 kids during my career, and it's really something special to watch and take part of. Okay, then we have to have blood no longer flowing through the umbilical arteries and vein. And that, um, that placenta has to detach from the wall of the uterus of the mother, or else she'll have problems with bleeding and infection. And there also has to be constriction of these umbilical arteries and vein uh, as well. Now, another thing is you need to start the work of oxygenation in the lungs. So the lungs have to expand. They've been scrunched up inside, and so they need to be able to expand. And there also needs to be an increased ability for blood to throw, flow through the, the arteries and veins in the lungs. Inside, they, they are uh, constricted down, so there's more resistance to blood flow. And that's why it says vascular resistance has to decrease. Uh, because uh, the arteries are um, not as open as they're going to be after birth occurs. So here is an illustration of the arteries being more open uh, as the time of delivery approaches and then after delivery as well. All right, now how do these things come about? What makes these things happen? Well, actual physical stretching of the umbilical cord as the baby comes out, now there's a tug on that between where the placenta is still attached to the mother and as the baby is on the outside, there's some physical tugging. And that in itself helps stimulate the blood vessels in the placenta to constrict. And then, of course, clamping itself. Uh, and the increased level of oxygen in the blood, now that the baby is on the outside and breathing outside air, the baby gets higher levels of oxygen now then was being supplied while the baby was inside mom. Mom was giving enough oxygen, but the baby gets even more once on the outside. And those increased levels of oxygen themselves, the oxygen itself is a direct stimulant for the blood vessels in the umbilical cord to constrict. And then clamping, biting, tearing, did I say biting? Well, Okay, we are fortunate to live in a place where we have beautiful hospitals with nice sterile facilities and these nice plastic cord clamps that we put on, but not everybody has that, right? So instead of using a human doing that, I'm showing here a wildebeest, where moms, okay, the mammals, the moms, they have to bite these umbilical cords. How would you like to do that, moms? <laughs> no? What if it was the dad's job? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then the kid would be in real trouble, right? <laughs> All right. 
So again, that job of oxygenation has to shift from the placenta to the lungs. As I already mentioned, the decrease in the vascular resistance, those, those arteries need to open up more, and there's also a growth in the greater number of arteries in the lungs as the time for delivery approaches. So here I'm showing you that you can see uh, on the left-hand side are the lungs before birth, on the right-hand side uh, as the time of birth approaches and afterwards, and you can see those darker, larger areas. Those are the arteries increasing in number and increasing in their diameter so that more flow can occur through them and decrease that resistance to flow through those arteries. And then we mentioned mechanical ex uh, expansion of the lungs themselves. Um, so instead of the lungs being uh, squinched up, you know, after the baby squeezes out, then they have the space to expand. And so that's one of the important things. And so here you can see a diagrammatic representation of the baby being squeezed as it comes out through the birth canal. So you can see that the, the relative size of things of the uh, pelvic uh, ring, the bony ring, the pelvis, and the outlet provided there is a high, another highly designed structure so that it and the size of the baby correlate well so the baby can get out but still have the proper squeeze on the lungs because there is fluid in the lungs that's supposed to be there during development. There are two types of cells that make up those little grapes at the end of the branching uh, structures in the lungs that is uh, the little chambers where the gas exchange uh, takes place and those are called alveoli, plural alveolus, singular. And there has to be, I mentioned, this surfactant that keeps those things open uh, while the baby's breathing out. And so you know, there are two types of cells in these alveoli. The real thin ones is where the uh, oxygen diffuses across from the uh, air sac to the blood vessels and where the carbon dioxide diffuses from the blood vessels to the air sac. And so that's where those very thin type 1 alveolar cells, that's where they do the work of the diffusion of the gases. And the type 2 cell, which is very large, is what manufactures the surfactant molecules that keep those air sacs open uh, all the time. And in here I just threw in for you the actual molecule that represents one of the types of molecules that is in that surfactant that these type 2 cells manufacture. And that's that thing that determines around 32 weeks of development whether the baby is mature enough in terms of lung function to be able to survive on the outside with or without ventilatory support. So it's that secretion of surfactant to the alveoli. So that and other fluids that are in there, they're supposed to be there, then get squeezed by this birth process uh, through the birth canal. And then if the baby has to have a C-section uh, to be taken out because of whatever medical problems, uh, the obstetricians only make the opening just big enough for the baby to come out and that squeezing still occurs. So here we're showing you then uh, a slice through lung tissue so the air chambers are there, and then you can see where there's the word capillary with an arrow pointing to a capillary in the area between the cells, uh, air chambers, air cells, uh, so that the exchange of gases can take place. The oxygen could get into the blood, and the carbon dioxide can leave the blood and then be breathed out. So as I mentioned before, this business of the thinning of the arteries uh, in the lungs, uh, so there's a diagrammatic representation of it. Here it is in actual slices through the arteries themselves. So the space between the black arrows is thickness of the muscle that surrounds the arteries. Uh, the, muscles have, uh, the arteries are lined uh, on the outside with muscles. Uh, and then you can see the much uh, thinner space between the black arrows on the right hand side. And then the white arrows indicating the uh, diameter of the, of the space through which the blood flows. So it's like going from a cow path to a 10-lane freeway in terms of being able to increase the blood flow. Um, and today we actually experienced a cow path uh, as we were trying to leave uh, um, Virginia up north by Eveleth. Uh, our GPS literally took us to this what used to be a bridge and a road and then the bridge had been shut down and 
we ended up having to back out of there. <laughs> so, so yeah, we experienced that as well as the freeways here. All right. So there's the expansion of the vessels there uh, to allow increased blood flow uh, as birth approaches. And then I just want to make a side comment here on the shape of the red blood cells that carry the oxygen uh, because notice they, they're not round like basketballs, right? They are this disc shape, kind of like a hockey puck, except both sides of the hockey puck are pushed in. That's why I mentioned hockey puck here in Minnesota. Uh, I think that works pretty well. Now the reason for that is, is because there is the maintenance of great amount of surface area but much smaller volume, minimal volume. So that way you can still get as much work in terms of carrying oxygen capacity, but it's much easier for those cells then to get through those small capillaries instead of being these spheres taking up much greater space. A highly designed, engineered system. And most folks are not aware that there actually is what's called the cytoskeleton, the skeleton that's inside the cells. There are internal skeletons inside the cells made up of protein, different molecules, three different categories of protein molecules, three different types of elements, categories of elements in the skeletons inside the cells. So that internal cytoskeleton, cell skeleton, is what keeps this biconcave disc shape another highly designed, engineered feature. It's not going to evolve. Because there's not time for it to evolve. Random chance events can't do this fast enough for the organism to survive from one generation to the next, and we know that dead things don't evolve, right? Okay, I had mentioned those pulmonary stretch receptors. Um, they're the special nerve endings that, that realize that, wow, the lungs are being stretched, and so they, are, they stimulate the inflation of the lungs, sending that signal up to the brain, saying, okay, breathe. And then the increased oxygen levels, this local effect, does what? It tells these blood vessels to open, these arteries in the lungs to open. Now, didn't I tell you earlier that the oxygen level going up told the arteries and the umbilical cord to constrict? Yes? So it's the very opposite effect by the very same stimulus that could not have evolved, that had to be a designed, engineered feature. There's a bunch of other factors, and mercifully, I won't go over them, <laughs> except to mention the bottom one. Nitric oxide, nitric oxide, also locally produced in the cells, has a local effect telling those arteries to open up to open up. So, do you want to hear a joke about nitric oxide? <laughs> yes? Yeah. No. <laughs> oh, <woo. laughs> All right. You're a good group. I like you. All right. So, guess what? There's all these other factors as well. It's so complex, so complex. There's no such thing as a simple cell. Yeah. All right, so let's look at the foramen ovale closing, the, the closure of the foramen ovale, that round window, that connection, that shortcut from the uh, right to the left side of the top part of the heart. Now, I want you to watch it closely, what happens in that uh, green um, rectangle there. Uh, in a bit. Uh, second thing, remember, is, is the ductus arteriosus closing, that bypass around the lungs. Third thing is the ductus venosus, that bypass around the liver has to close, umbilical vein has to close, umbilical arteries have to close. All right, all of these things have to happen, so let's take a look at them. Closure of the foramen ovale, all right, here it is blown up a bit larger. Notice it looks like a door on a hinge, that flap. Looks like a door on a hinge. So when the baby is on the outside and breathing, so now there is so much more blood flowing through the left side of the heart, increasing the pressure in the left side of the heart. Okay. Decreased blood coming back from the vena cava because the placenta has been 
clamped off, so now there's a decrease in flow and a decrease in pressure, uh, at least a decrease in pressure, on the right side of the heart. All right? So now what's going to happen? With that increased pressure, that door is going to slam shut. Watch the door. Boom. And it happens just about that fast. Okay? Takes a few seconds. All right? So that's how that is shut. And then, over the next uh, two or three weeks, um, cells grow and the thing is sealed shut. So, so that there's permanent separation of the two halves of the heart. Wow. Is that also not a highly designed, engineered feature? What about closure of the ductus arteriosus, that bypass around the lungs? All right, so in this very special short segment, again, there are increased oxygen levels, and unlike the lungs, the increased oxygen here tells this thing to close down, just the opposite of the effect of the lungs. There's a sudden absence of a particular molecule, uh, we call it prostaglandin E2, and it is an instantaneous drop. How in the world can it be an instantaneous drop? Where in the world is it coming from? Can anybody think about this for a second? Let's see if you guys can figure it out. Exactly. Who gets the gold star? All right. Exactly. Because of the clamping of the cord, the source from the placenta is instantaneously shut off. So this prostaglandin E2, which has been telling this bypass to stay open during pregnancy, is no longer there to tell it to stay open. And so now that's the second reason why it shuts down. And other factors as well. There's a bunch more. We won't go into those. But I think those two are the most dramatic. All right. Oh, did you see here the change that happens? so that it goes from this big wide artery down to that ligament. It becomes a ligament over the course of the next weeks. All right? There you are, thin ligament. And here's a picture of it during pregnancy with the uh, ultrasound showing the ductus arterius. And it needs to be open during pregnancy so that blood can go around the lungs. Closure of the ductus venosus, okay, factors here. There's the clamping of the cord. I'll show you that one again, so in case you missed it, there's the cord being applied. So there's that tremendous decrease in blood flow, oxygen levels going up, and a bunch of stuff. Tell this thing to close in about 90 seconds. Okay. Same thing with the umbilical arteries and vein. You've got the clamp, cessation of blood flow, oxygen levels are up, in the, uh, the part uh, still attached uh, on, the, on the baby side of the clamp and the other things telling it to close very quickly. Okay, there's a bunch of other stuff that goes on. Total blood volumes decrease because there's some blood that's left behind in the uh, placenta and the other part of the umbilical cord. That's why it's important for the baby to be held at the same level as the mother, not to hold the baby up high. The baby won't have enough blood, not to hold it too low. It'll have too much blood and have problems because of that. Okay, uh, blood pressure increases uh, as the heart's really pumping a lot more now. Uh, the distribution, now there's a lot more blood going to be going through the gut circulation, through the lung circulation. Decrease in the resting pulse. The resting pulse uh, normal is considered to be around 160 or so prior to delivery. Uh, 120 is considered uh, low normal. If it gets down to 100 prior to or during delivery, that baby's in deep trouble, deep trouble shows that the heart's not getting enough oxygen. Uh, after delivery, uh, 120 is considered normal for the newborn. And then as the baby gets older and older and older through adult size, it keeps dropping until in adult males, we consider um, in the 60s, uh, even 70s, a normal resting pulse, and in ladies, 70s, 80s. But people who have great um, tone in their cardiovascular system can have normal Resting pulses much lower than that. Well-conditioned athletes. All right. 
Now, hemoglobin is that stuff that's inside the red blood cells that actually does the job of carrying oxygen, all right? And there's more of the hemoglobin in the babies because there is less amount of oxygen. You know, mom's not able to give as much oxygen to the baby as the baby gets after birth. So there's more hemoglobin, so those concentrations change. And then the kind of hemoglobin that's present is very important, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this one. We have actually five different kinds of hemoglobin. The adult, which we, uh, we here have about 98 or so percent adult hemoglobin. Then fetal hemoglobin, which we still have uh, one to two percent of. And then three kinds of embryonic hemoglobin. Embryo is that very, very early, early part of uh, development. So the place where blood is made at first is called the yolk sac, and that is a terrible, terrible, evolutionarily influenced name because of the assumption of evolution. Never had anything to do with yolk, never contained yolk, and if you think so, the yolk is on you. <laughs> okay, along with that, we never had gill slits. We were all taught that we had gill slits in our neck. No such thing. There were never gills, never to do with oxygenation, no fish stage of development. That is ridiculous evolutionary garbage. Gill slits are properly called the pharyngeal pouches, and multiple structures develop from those very important. Many of the glands in this area, parathyroid glands, um, many other things. Yolk sac, I already told you, did not have anything to do with yolk, but it's the first site of blood production. Okay, and we never had a tail. It's just simply that the tissue of the spinal cord and the surrounding structures grow faster, further than the surrounding tissues catch up later. No tail, no tailbone, okay? So if you fell on your tailbone and broke it, you didn't break that, you broke your coccyx. That's the proper name for it. And it has a real function, because people who have, anybody here break their coccyx? Yes? You found out when you tried to stand up or sit down how much it hurts or have a bowel movement? Painful. Real function, because the muscles used to stand and sit and have a bowel movement are attached to the coccyx, not an evolutionary leftover. So back to the not yolk sac, the umbilical vesicle is its proper name. And unfortunately, still too much of medical and biological literature still refers to yolk sac, but it's gradually changing as they get with the program. So in the early stages of development are those three kinds of, um, of the uh, embryonic hemoglobin. Uh, then the blood formation site shifts to the liver and spleen. Wow. How can that evolve? It can't. And then finally, it shifts to the bone marrow. Well, why, doesn't, why don't you make your blood in the bone marrow from the beginning? Because you don't have bones in the early part of development. They don't exist yet. All righty, so here we come back to this mention of this uh, baby that was born at 28 weeks uh, development with the cord coming out in the cab. Uh, and we're going to come back to that in just the next slide or two. But I want to show you here those three lines that are low on the left are the three embryonic hemoglobin types. Notice they're Greek letters with different sub, uh, subsets there, indicating two of each kind of these different Greek letters, uh, zeta, eta, alpha, gamma. And then for the adult hemoglobin, it's alpha and beta. So there's the same chains are used in different combinations. And why is this necessary? It's because of those changing conditions all throughout development with the amount of oxygen that the developing embryo and then fetus, and then finally fully formed baby, uh, have. And the, the amount of acid-base balance, it changes with those conditions, especially from before the time the placenta kicks in to doing its job until after. So that's why these different kinds of hemoglobin are necessary, so that they can do the proper job of taking the oxygen from mother and then being able to release the oxygen to the tissues. And so that's why five different kinds of hemoglobin are necessary. Again, how in the world can this evolve? It's not possible. So what is the significance of all of this? All right. Irreducible complexity, 
meaning that the system, all the parts of the system have to be there, and if you take out one too many parts of that system, it can no longer function. You can't reduce the system anymore. And so take out, for example, one of those types of hemoglobin. That baby's not going to survive. Okay? So all of those parts have to be there. All of these five structures, whether it be the bypass around the lungs, the bypass around the liver, the opening connecting the two parts of the upper part of the heart, the closure of the umbilical vein arteries, all that stuff has to be there. All that stuff has to happen at the right time, at the right speed, at the right place. Have any one of those things not work and the whole thing falls apart. Irreducible complexity at many levels here, many, many types of irreducible complexity. Everything has to happen at the right order, at the right amount, at the right speed. So, we didn't even talk about the birth process itself. That would be a whole series of lectures all by itself. We didn't even mention that. So complex. And it's very complex combination of biochemistry from the mom and the dad for uh, implantation, pregnancy to even happen, and then all the hormonal changes that happen in the mom uh, approaching the time of birth and then at the time of birth, the softening of the cartilage between the two parts of the uh, pelvis in the front so that the pelvis can widen out more for the delivery. I mean, just so many different things that have to happen. There's no way this could ever happen on its own. This cannot evolve. The Creator God of the Bible is our Lord and Savior. So now I'm going to tell you about the, um, the rest of the story. Let me just see. Okay, uh, not quite yet. Let's do you these two verses. So he answered them and said to them, Have you not read that he, he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? Christ is speaking here. He's talking about himself in the third person because he was present at creation. Not after some long period of time for evolution to happen. And here we have, this is not a suggestion, but a command. Right? It's a command. Sanctify the Lord in your hearts and always be ready to, to give a defense for those who ask of you the reason for the hope that lies within you. And do it with gentleness and fear, meaning with meekness, with gentleness, gentleness, fear, with respect, to do it with respect. We cannot argue a person into the truth. Our job is simply to put the truth in front of them. So we need to be knowledgeable at various levels. This, this, these concepts can be given a very simple level. Uh, not doesn't have to be a complex level. Put the truth in front of the person and then let the Holy Spirit do its job of conviction. We can't argue someone into the truth, but we can do our job of presenting the truth to them. So back to the baby that we mentioned before, 28 weeks was uh, delivered. So uh, the obstetrician, after the completed the delivery, the baby was halfway out, uh, got to the hospital. Uh, the father finally arrived and the obstetrician said, um, we're in danger of losing both the baby and the mom. So, you know, pray and hang in there. And they did not have the ability to provide nutrition through what we call total parental nutrition, TPN, giving all sorts of things through IVs. So the nurses, this baby was so tiny, at one pound, 12 ounces, 800 grams, one pound, 12 ounces, this baby was so tiny, the nurses had to feed with a medicine dropper, okay? But they couldn't give enough fluids in through that alone, all right? Oxygenation was real tricky matter. The you know, technology not available for a baby that tiny and so the nurses had to give uh, turns doing rotations of bagging and supplying enough oxygen, but not too much, because physicians know that if you give too much oxygen, you'll stimulate too much blood vessel formation in the eye and the ret in the retina and block light and not have vision, be blind. So they knew they needed to be sparing with the oxygen. Okay, not enough fluids could be given through the, through the medicine dropper and no IVs large enough for uh, this, such a tiny baby. So the nurses would give fluids by injecting it through a syringe into the muscle, what little bit of muscle this baby had. Temperature, okay, no fancy electronic uh, incubator, so it was the shoebox and the light bulb. All right, so, 
the uh, baby grew up, did well in school, went to medical school, and uh, went to uh, train at a hospital, and then knew the name of the physician who had delivered that baby, arranged to meet with the physician in his office, said, hey, I heard at the hospital the story about this kid you delivered some time ago who went through all this stuff. And he said, yeah, I remember that kid. And he said, yeah, the last time I heard, he didn't have any deformities. And the physician said, well, I hope not. I hope not, because you're looking at him. <laughs> all right? And so that made that physician's that obstetrician's day. He was so thrilled to get that feedback after, you know, a uh, couple and a half decades of that baby doing well. Well, how do I know all the gory details of that story? Because I am that baby. Wow. So, so the Lord is gracious. He had his hand on me from the very beginning. All right, so it's quite a story. And these are our offspring. My wife here, uh, Patty, wave, please. Hi. <laughs> uh, she had to go through a C-section, so we know a C-section works in terms of squeezing that fluid out, because our firstborn was so obstinate he wouldn't come out. So after 10 days past the, past the due date, she had to be sliced open. And uh, fortunately, I uh, was able to have the next two children uh, through vaginal delivery, so I was very happy about that. So these are our three offspring. They're a bit older than this photo. This is the most recent good photo that we can get, because they won't cooperate giving us a you know, beautiful photo like this. You know how they are. So the one worm says to the other worm, I mean, the one bird says to the other bird, I've been stuffing worms into it all day, and it still is hungry. So, um, so I've been stuffing information into you, um, so I'll be happy to take questions uh, 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 in just a bit, but I will say a few things otherwise, um, is that um, you can go to this website uh, for the Arizona Origin Science Association, azosa.org, and there are a series of 18 PowerPoints that go through the first 11 chapters of Genesis a nearly a verse-by-verse -verse basis, question and answer format, illustrated by art of various types uh, from the creation perspective. And so this can give, be a very useful tool to share with other people. Very straightforward, put in very simple terms of uh, those first 11 chapters of Genesis. So azosa.org, it's, uh, if you have friends who, who do better in either Russian or in Spanish than English, those languages are there as well. So it's there for English, Russian, and Spanish. Um, this particular DVD is the presentation I gave you today, um, and we have it available here. Uh, we have only 18 copies. We've sold a bunch of them on Sunday. Uh, so, if, so be the first 18 to get that. The list price on that DVD and the others that the Arizona Origin Science Association has produced is 13 bucks standard price. We'll sell them to you guys for five bucks. Unlimited numbers. So buy as many as you want. Give them to other folks, give them to friends, enemies, whoever. And, uh, and, and so we have this particular one here as well. The others are very interesting topics. As a matter of fact, one of them is of Dr. Anderson, who's going to be here next month. So we have a DVD that he produced. Uh, he, uh, we let uh, us film for him. And we have ones on energy and the beginning of the universe. Another one on the firefly. Okay, you were in Minnesota, fireflies, right? Okay, it talks about how fireflies light their fire, okay? <laughs> and then, um, let's see, and the other one is on the Grand Canyon. Very useful information on the Grand Canyon. So those are very good DVDs, uh, five bucks each only. And then we have this book, Walt Brown. Some of you know of Walt Brown or maybe know him. It's this tremendous encyclopedic type book. Its list price is 30 bucks. If you spend 100 bucks on other stuff, we'll give this to you. What a bargain, right? Okay. And how many of those do we have? 
Okay. You're not supposed to say quite a few. You're to... <laughs> okay, at least 10 of those. All right. And I think that it, this is the pictures of the five that Azosa has produced. And so here's a command. Be ready, be sharp. So that's why I showed the cactus from my front yard. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Ignorance meaning not knowing. They're foolish for not knowing. All right? So we need to help folks come to truth and knowledge. And I think, yeah, we're done. Uh, how would you, is it necessary to get uh, the medical profession to uh, understand the help? Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> because I, I, I found, is it possible that they uh, are being misled by their, their belief in evolution into a false medical practice? That's not good for the patient. Like, for instance, me, I was diagnosed with uh, a spinal stenosis. Can you hear me? Okay. And uh, the, the, the surgeon said, uh, well, we can trim away the reptilian part of your spine to relieve pressure on those nerves. <laughs> no. The other time, too, I also had a ruptured appendix, and the nurse was saying, oh, don't worry, that's just something you got left over from evolution anyway. You don't need that. All right. Um, juicy stuff. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll go ahead and answer that. Uh, you don't have a reptilian part of your spine, uh, but the spinal stenosis is something that does need to be treated by removing some tissue, but not because of evolution. Uh, in terms of the appendix, the appendix is very much a necessary organ. It's part of your immune system, and it has several functions, uh, one of which is to help protect against infection in the GI tract, the gut. And the appendix, uh, is uh, responsible for stimulating the production of immunoglobulin A, which is the type of molecule that fights infection inside the gut, and also stimulates the production of immunoglobulin G and immunoglobulin M in the blood, so that if that infection escapes the gut and gets into the bloodstream, that those antibodies are there to fight the infection in the bloodstream as well. In addition, when you have a severe case of diarrhea, and the gut gets washed out, you have many kinds of beneficial microorganisms, viruses, bacteria, fungi, and something called archaea. And those are replaced because the appendix acts as a reservoir of those beneficial organisms so that they can recolonize the gut and uh, restore you back to your normal good bacteria status. And in people who have had their appendix removed uh, prior to the age of 10, give or take a couple years either way, they have higher incidences of certain types of cancerous type diseases because they did not have the appendix there in those early, after those early years to uh, surveil against cancer type cells. Um, yes? I'm, I'm sorry, give him the microphone, please. Or whichever one's answering, I'm sorry. I guess he was first. I was raised on a farm in western Minnesota. No, I think yours has to be off before this is on. This is kind of common. Okay, I have to keep turning it off and on. Okay. All right, go. Now? Now? Oh, okay. Not so close. I was raised on a farm in western Minnesota where we raised pigs. I was remarking here, thinking about the importance of the clamping during this process where it causes a lot of things to happen. And I was present at a lot of times when baby pigs were being born, eight and 10 at a time, and we never had to clamp anything. So I just wanted to mention that there are other mechanisms provided for other types of mammals. Right, the, the, oxygen, the oxygen levels being higher stimulating the uh, constriction of the blood vessels and the other chemicals involved as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. They thought tonsils weren't necessary either when, when I was young, so almost all of my generation had their tonsils off. What, what do you have to say with that? Same story. Same story as the appendix. The tonsils and adenoids are also part of the immune system and, and they 
our, that first line of defense against respiratory infection, people cough and sneeze on you. And again, when those are taken out earlier in life, uh, those people are at higher risks for certain types of cancer as well. There's a difference, yeah. Same thing, same story. Uh, and now the rates, uh, I have to mention, the rates of appendectomy and tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy, are a fraction of what they used to be, because now the medical folks understand that these are necessary organs. So all that teaching in past years that these were the useless leftovers in evolution is no longer taking place in the medical schools. But it took a long time for that change to come about. Could you comment on the ovalgy and the, uh, the other valves that are shutting down after the baby leaves? Um, at some point, so that mother may have a second child. What does it, is this to repeat the process? Is there a, a reopening? And, and how does all that work? I mean, what does it look like in a, in a woman who has not had a baby? Is there any references to these things being there or being ready to be opened? Okay, if I understand your question correctly, you're asking about the things that have to close down. Those are happening in the baby, not the mother. Those are all happening in the baby. The mother's uh, structures do not change, except she has uh, greater <coughs> blood volume since she's doing the work for two. So she will have a significantly greater blood volume and the heart has to work harder. And the mother's heart rate is faster than a pregnancy, a pregnant mother's heart rate is faster than a non-pregnant lady. Also, because of all that extra work, her temperature is higher. That's why when Dr. Fahrenheit calibrated the temperature, the thermometer that we use today, he had set normal to be 100, but he didn't realize his wife was pregnant and her temperature was <laughs> higher. And so that's why it's the average of 98 Point six is considered the average of normal in the non-pregnant person. So you can thank Mrs. Fahrenheit <laughs> for normal not being 100. Or you can thank him for making her pregnant, I guess. But uh, you know, uh, so that's why normal is not at 100 in the Fahrenheit scale. So, my wife is pregnant with our first child, and we've been enjoying reading every week of development the what's going on this week. And um, it talked about intestines forming in the umbilical cord and then going into the baby back a couple weeks. Could you talk about that? No, um, not intestines forming in the um, umbilical cord, but rather intestines, uh, intestinal tissue forming from cells from the umbilical vesicle. Those cells migrate to a different location. We have lots of different things where cells migrate from one location to another. Part of the pituitary gland migrates from the roof of the mouth, okay? Um, the testicles in males migrate all the way down from in the abdominal region down into the scrotum. So there's lots of migration going on. And it's not seasonal. <laughs> We deal with lots of we deal with lots of Minnesota um, snowbirds in Arizona. 